Thank you. Um, so I get to kick this off, and uh, I will. Uh, I was. I was. Cody asked me for a title, and I didn't really have a lot of time to think about it, and I came up with this. Um, the The reason that I'm interested in E is because uh, I tend to think mostly about complex phenotypes, and. Uh, um, I've been trying to understand the role of the environment in things like adaptation and uh, human uh, traits of various sorts. And I'll give you some examples as we go along. And uh, so in, when you use um, a standard sort of genetic reference book about population genetics, <clears throat> and you look at some of the literature out there, here's kind of what seems to be the prevalent view. So you've got phenotypes, which could include things like disease susceptibility, um, demographic characteristics, uh, mortality rates, and so forth. You've got an environment, and you've got the genotype. And a lot of the analysis of this kind of information is built around a linear model. Um, the linear model says that your phenotype is something to do with the genotype plus something to do with the environment. Uh, and since it's a linear model, all these are linear things of various sorts. Um, the environment is, in this uh, kind of picture, extremely simple. Um, and basically what you do is uh, look at the relationship between specific genes and specific phenotypes. Um, this has been remarkably successful in some cases and remarkably unsuccessful in others. And the thing that is often done by people is to talk about um, the sources of variation, which um, relate variation in the phenotype, which is V sub P, to variation in the genes, which is V sub G, and variation in the environment. And then you have this quantity called the heritability, which is um, the additive genetic contribution of the genes divided to the variants, divided by the total phenotypic variance. And this picture is, uh, you know, it's widely used. Uh, there's lots of um, software to do it and so on. And it's taken quite seriously by people who are not trained in evolutionary genetics. Um, so this uh, is taken seriously by um, people in the social sciences and behavioral sciences and so on. And uh, one of the challenges of interdisciplinary work, I think, is that when you are within a discipline, you use a lot of ideas, notions, models. And these models have limitations which, when you are in the discipline, you are keenly aware of. But when you're outside the discipline, you don't know that there are limitations. You say, this is the way the world works. Um, one of the consequences of this, which uh, most of you know very well, is that if you have an additive model and the environment is extremely simple, uh, it really influences the formation of the phenotype and pretty much nothing else. And if you have weak selection, then you get this result which you can derive under all sorts of conditions. And it's been derived uh, in various forms. Um, for nearly a century by different people under you know, these limitations. So the first thing that you find is that heritability is, is almost fixed in this picture. And the second is that the rate of change of mean phenotype is essentially the heritability times the strength of selection. Those are two sort of givens. Um, and people use this a lot. Um, so the first thing you can say is you can look at long run evolution. You can say, well, you know, evolutionary change that is microevolutionary change is where you've got a species and you've simply got a shift in the genetic composition of the species. And it might take about a thousand generations or something like that. And macroevolutionary change, which is the formation of new species and things of that sort, might take 10 to the 6 or 10 to the 9 generations. It goes on for a long time. Uh, my old boss, Dick Lewontin, uh, this is where I heard this particular line. He may well have gotten it from someone else. Um, but 
The point about this, which, this fact, which we don't often think about, is that um, it hasn't, it's from an, this kind of evolutionary perspective, it's literally been the blink of an eye since the Roman Republic. So genetically, there's no reason to think that we're any different from the Romans, um, if this is in fact true. And we don't actually have a very good idea whether it's true or not. Um, one thing you can do is you can look across species. And when you start looking across species, there are various ways of estimating heritability. And uh, there's you know, ways of estimating additive genetic variation. And then there's ways of demonstrating that there is selection. And then you can go out and you can actually look at natural populations and say, well, I've got heritability, I've got selection, and therefore I should see a change. And more often than not, you see no change. Species just sort of sit there and uh, do whatever they do. And so it's very difficult to understand <clears throat> why the world is organized a certain way or why it's not being disorganized in a specific way because of this. <clears throat> this is an important thing which uh, is, has caused some debate in, say, the demographic community, for instance, because the same sort of thing happens over there. You know, you find heritability using a variety of models for things like fertility. And you say, well, obviously fertility is related to fitness, therefore there is selection on it, and therefore there must have been selection on fertility, and there are people who think it's happened in the last century or two. And in fact, if you look at the way human populations work, uh, fertility has sort of been going in the wrong direction from this perspective. Um, so when you start thinking about this, you are naturally drawn to the idea that if you get more information, it's going to be a good thing. And so one thing you can do is you can start looking at uh, GWAS. And in this, you have data on um, single nucleotide polymorphisms, a lot of them. The number of those and their locations on the genes are a function of technology. You know, it's technology driven by informed uh, choice and so on, but nonetheless, it's driven by technology primarily. Uh, the number of people that you can collect data on is driven by cost and how much NIH is willing to fund if you're in this country, NSF if you're operating on the cheap. Uh, and then you try and do meta-analyses otherwise. And the number of phenotypes that you can uh, actually get information on is again driven to, a, to some extent, certainly, by factors that are really not scientific per se. Another possibility is you can do, you can collect data on omics. Um, so you can look at the metabolome, you can look at proteomics, you can do that kind of thing. And you have similar kinds of constraints there. You know, you have to deal with the technology that you have and the money that you have at hand. So I'm going to give you one example of an, uh, a study in which we used an omics approach to look at uh, fruit flies, and in particular, the fruit fly that I want to talk about is a kind of Drosophila, but it's not your favorite Drosophila, probably. These are Drosophila mohavensis, which are a, a desert Drosophila. They're bigger than um, the usual lab Drosophila that we're familiar with. And they actually breed lay eggs on cactus. So here's the situation. This little finger pointing down here is Baja California. That's the mainland. And you have essentially two different types of cacti uh, on Baja and the mainland. And they differ in terms of the typical diameter of these uh, stems that they have. And there has been um, a movement of these Drosophila mohavensis from Baja to the mainland. Um, and that's taken place over quite a lot of years. Now, what does that do to the fly? Well, it turns out that if you are going to lay your eggs in a cactus that is about 
yay across, uh, the way you do it is you wait for a rot to form in the cactus. And then you've got a rot which might be that big, if you're lucky. And this thing dries out pretty quick. On the other hand, if you move to a region where the cacti are sort of like that, and they have big barrels on them, then when you get a rot, the rot takes a long time to dry out. Now, if you think about what this is doing to a fly, it's actually exerting extremely strong selection on development time, because you're laying eggs in this thing. You have, those eggs have to actually go through the cycle and it close and produce adults before the rot dries. That's what's going on. So we have uh, short development time in one area, long development time in the other, and Bill Edges and Bill Heed before him did a bunch of experiments where they showed that indeed, you know, you can go out and you collect flies in the, in, in the wild, you can uh, do the standard sorts of experiments that population geneticists do, and there's clearly some kind of directional selection at work. So we said, terrific. Now what we're going to do is we're going to use the new genetic stuff, and we're going to learn more about this. So we thought about how to do it, and the idea that we came up with was that we should look at the life cycle of these organisms, and we should try and follow something about the genome in the course of this life cycle. Now, as I will say again before I, I close, the genome to me is a dynamic entity. It's not something that you are, it is in a sense, of course, something that you're born with, but what it does over time is really the, the nub of it, you know. The, um, genes are a network. We've, you know, got lots of people studying genomes as networks, but they're a dynamic network. In the first, um, say, month of a human's life, those genes have to come together in particular ways to form a structure and to, you know, produce some of the early developmental things that are going on. And then those same genes have to do other things when you are 30 years old and still other things when you are 60 and so on. And so networks are dynamic. And what we were trying to do was trace the dynamics of these networks over the course of a fly's life consistent with how much money we had, which wasn't terribly easy, but you know, we uh, were interested in these life history questions primarily. And these are the obvious things, you know, what is the genomic basis of uh, what we're seeing out there. <clears throat> so, in particular, the last point, how do genome scale developmental programs change through the life cycle? And so we did an experiment, and the essence of this was that we followed, oh, there we go. is there a pointer here? That didn't work. Okay. No pointer? No pointer. Okay, no worries. So what we were doing was we were following flies through their life cycle. So you've got the egg stage, larval stages, uh, eclosion, and adulthood. And we started, we wanted, ideally, to sample the same individual over and over again, but it's very difficult to do that with a fly because when you pull, the wings off, the poor sucker, you know, it's done. And so, what do you do? Well, okay, you start with a large cohort, and you simply sample randomly from this cohort every few days, and then you sort of hope for the best. And of course, you do replications and what have you, and you try and get a dynamic time series, and this time series contains gene expression over the course of life, and we've got, you know, flies from different regions on different habitats and so on, and then the question is, how do you analyze this stuff? Um, well, you've got the standard problem you, you have with all this kind of data, which is you need to reduce the dimensionality in some informative way. And the method we used was developed actually here by Orly Alter, you know, maybe uh, uh, not far from here. And she suggested singular value decompositions kind of generalized, and we tried that. And we discovered something interesting. The first is, what we found was that there were correlated patterns of gene expression, uh, and these did change through time in a characteristic way. But what we discovered was patterns that were true for flies collected in different places and living on different types of cacti. So the signals we were picking up were conserved signals. 
These were signals that made flies fly, as it were. And they were not telling us anything um, meaningful about the differences that we were after. Um, since I'm seeing a sign here that I'm running out of time, I want to talk briefly about human traits. Uh, and you might say, well, you know, what are you interested in human traits uh, for one, met one set of questions, of course, has to do with um, what makes us the way we are. But I'm specifically interested in environmental gradients. Uh, there are gradients in things like fertility, which are well known. There are gradients in things like mortality. Um, and one of the questions we're after is, to what extent does genetics contribute to the understanding of disparity? Um, here's an example constructed by Ben, my colleague Ben Seligman over there. You, for mortality, this is a Kaplan-Meier survival curve for a sample taken from the, human, uh, the Health and Retirement Survey. And the horizontal axis shows days into the study and the vertical axis is the fraction still alive. And what you see here is those four colored lines represent mortality experience but as a function of income quintile in the population. And so if you are richer or better educated, you live longer. Uh, we have no idea why. We just, we've got lots of theories about why, but we don't know why. And we are still trying to sort of grapple with this fact. Um, so you could try to use GWAS, which I've talked about. <clears throat> and GWAS uses linear models. They, they, they suffer from problems of high dimensionality. Um, all of you are familiar with these kinds of things. You can try and use this method called GCTA, which does all SNPs together um, with uh, my colleague Sid. Sid, we've looked at this. And we believe, we have demonstrated analytically and by simulations and so on, that it's difficult to estimate a genetic relatedness matrix accurately the way the, this procedure defines it, which is using all the SNPs together at one go. And the estimates that you get from that are sort of unstable. So I want to finish by talking about just one last thing, which is that when we think about phenotypes, and environments. The environment is actually a complicated object. There's a developmental environment, there's a, a, you know, an early adult environment, there's a late adult environment, and these environments are not the same. They don't have the same effect. They don't interact with the genome in different ways. Um, and genes really do different things when they are placed in different environmental contexts. One of the earliest experiments which demonstrated G by E was done on this campus by Klaus and Keck and Heise, um, you know, something like 70 or 80 years ago in the Carnegie Institution. And any gardener knows that about G by E effects because as a gardener, you can take a bunch of clonal seeds and then you are going to find the right place to grow the plant. And if you stick it on that windowsill where it ain't getting much light and forget all about it, it's not going to do very well. So that's an example of a G by E effect. And this life is full of them. So my perspective on this is to think of genes as dynamic entities which change through the life course. And the phenotype should be thought of as some general function of the genome that you are endowed with at birth, as well as these different environments which interact with the gene to produce a phenotypic change in the course of your life. And I have to stop. I'm supposed to do something, but I don't know what. Uh, so we, the question is, uh, can you mate flies that, that come from different regions or were fed on different uh, media? And um, 
then look at, at, at expression changes? And the answer is, if you do standard population genetic experiments on these guys and just look at you know, phenotypic traits and whether they're inherited and so on, you can detect these effects. Um, we're trying to get uh, uh, NSF to give us money to do this precisely like that. Yes, sir. A great experiment that since it was done in the 1990s, a lot of people have forgotten it. Um, that Tur Eric Turkheimer did on computing the heritability of intelligence in middle class white areas in Virginia. He's a professor of psychology at University of Virginia. And then uh, computing by looking at relatives uh, and did the same exact calculations using a sample from a disadvantaged community and found that in the uh, middle class community, the heritability of IQ is estimated by correlations between relatives was 60% and couldn't be told as different from zero when it was measured in the other community. Yeah, good example of the effects of environment on individuals. Okay, thank you. <laughs>